Okay, come on, let's get started. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Oren, um, and I'll talk about uh, statistical element locators and uh, why, what I think is currently missing in Selenium, why, why I think uh, uh, this should be added to the Selenium. Um, so in the last 20 years, I've done a lot to help developers uh, test or write their code. I've done hardware verifications. Uh, I've, I've worked at AppliTools eyes that, that you almost might have known. Uh, and I've uh, working on um, having better selectors uh, that can speed up, uh, no more flaky tests. That's my goal for the next uh, a year or two, uh, to have no more flaky tests. So I want, in this session, I want to talk about why am, I, uh, why am I building, what exactly are we building, and how, does it, how, do, how will it help uh, every uh, tester and developer out there uh, to do his job much better. And, um, and, and we're going to focus on, on one thing, um, which, is, which is the stimuli, which is Usually you set up, for before any test, you set up some data, you do some actions, and then you assert. So we're gonna focus about mostly on the, the stimuli part, and, um, and that's the user in interaction. That's what you guys know. Uh, and this is something that, unlike unit testing, uh, this is the part that the API, which is actually the UI, it keeps changing. And because it keeps changing, uh, we get tests that fail, those false positives, uh, we want to reduce them to zero. So this is what we're going to talk about. So on the stimuli side, we're going to focus, we're going to drill down even more about how locators are building. Every click, you find an element, then you click it. So you have to find it first. So we're going to look at that. We're going to start uh, very softly. I know there's a few that uh, uh, they're just beginners, so we're going to talk about a few, few minutes about how the browser and actually how Selenium, how they uh, operate, how they find elements, uh, and then we'll move on and see how we can improve that. So, um, so wait a second, something stuck. Technical problem. Oh, oh and uh, update the selector as well. So so it has, it's not just about uh, record playback. What, what, you have, what we want to do is actually think about it. When the application changes, you want the selector to update automatically uh, just as well as, as you did it. Uh, and that's not simple. Um, first of all, what I've noticed that most uh, record playback tools um, actually do is they only record once. They only record at the minute when you, you show them. Uh, so it's weird, how do you know when you're recording right now that this ID is random generated or not? You can't, you can never know. I can, uh, I can add a random generated, I can do it, I can take that number that was in the random generated and m make it fixed so it won't never change. Uh, there's companies like Google when you see every time they release, every six weeks they change the IDs, everything's being compiled. So you actually, you don't know and you can't count on, uh, on that being uh, steady or not steady, unless you know the application. So the question is, what happens if you do write something that looks at the application and does exactly uh, uh, a bit of the work that you really wanna hate to do, is look every time at the application, see what's different, and update the selector for you. So that's, uh, so that's what we try to do. Uh, the different you can you can ha you'll have the slides there. So um, how browsers with what their optimizations are finding uh, they're just finding uh, different uh, properties. That's what they know how to do. 
and they have a better understanding of, of their shortcut for IDs in class. Um, and of course, you can do um, uh, the logical of uh, and. If you want something that has this and this, uh, we'll see everything how it comes in handy. Uh, something that uh, CSS selectors are only adding right now in the spec for the last year, the W3 spec, is actually using the parent. How do I want to find something based on its child, not its parent? Usually until now, CSS selectors, you might know, uh, you can find an element based on, okay, find me the parent, and I want to find some, some uh, inner element inside, inside that one. So, but what happens if you want to if you want to find something relative, uh, find the, uh, the parent that has some text inside of it? Uh, you can see those kind of examples even a bit more complicated when you have you want to select a checkbox, but the checkbox has doesn't have the text. There's another label next to it, so you want to check something. Uh, you want to find someone relative to its parent and actually find that one relative to his child that has that text. So you have three lists and one has that text, you want to find it, get that parent and get, uh, and get uh, the one that's relative to it. And of course you, you'd prefer using CSS Selecto because that's very super optimized uh, and every code that you write yourself, it has bugs. Uh, trust me, I've written so much code, so many bugs. Um, so. Uh, so CSS, but, but everyone knows CSS. Uh, I guess people, who here usually in, in their code uses CSS selectors? Uh, who uses XPath? So there's, a, there's still a huge advantage to XPath, that's because of the parent locators and the text, uh, but it's closing up. It's, uh, um, CSS will probably in the future, that's my guess, they'll continue to evolve and they'll have uh, all the features of uh, XPath. Um, so, how do you choose? Okay, so the first one we already do it. Uh, we already done that. So you have an element, uh, and you want to find that element again the next time. Uh, as I said, it doesn't have to be with radical playback, but this is usually what happens when you use radical playback. It says you run it, you record an ID, and then you play it back, and it goes where, uh, and uh, so you have to find out what happened. So you just run it again, and as you said, random ideas. That's, uh, that happens a lot. Um, second thing is what happens when you, someone, when you didn't change, but there's a new version, and that's, that's what we talked about um, when actually, um, so, when, so the code changed. It means that there's a lot of cases, you didn't change the code, someone else changed the code application, didn't tell you. Why? Because it's separated. There's a lot of cases where the, who's in charge of the app is not in charge of the testing and vice versa. So because it's aspect-oriented programming, so there's one thing that goes without uh, the having, letting the other person know that something uh, affects it. Um, well, you, if you couldn't find it using jQuery, then uh, usually then you say there's a new version, there's those hash killers, the cache killers, that they were ch finding those iframes, it's, yeah, it's not as that simple. Um, what happens when you find, you find something you see, an, you, see an element, you see the element with ID, and you, when you use jQuery to find it, uh, you, see that's a, you find another element. That's weird, I've, I've noticed that too. It seems that a lot of people use the same ID twice. Well, thank you. Uh, so, so it seems that the browsers don't enforce of using the same ID, uh, only a unique ID. Um, and, there, and there's a lot of apps that actually people use that. I don't know why, but I've seen so many apps. Uh, and usually when you find an element, it's, it's not find elements, plural, it's find element, so it gives you the first one. So sometimes it's not gonna find your elements. It's gonna find something else. But at least it's deterministic. It, was, it will always return the first one, and then you'll, you'll see that it's returned something else. Uh, that was a bit trickier. I had something that actually uh, worked 50% of the time. Uh, you can find the idea, that was weird, uh, and that was, two bodies, uh, there was things that generate HTML, there were a lot of uh, bad things uh, past then um, that actually generate two bodies. So you had two bodies in the same HTML. I didn't think it's possible, but it seems that it is. Um, and this is just when we were talking about ideas. Uh, a lot of people say, okay, so we have reusable components, let's use classes. Uh, and when we talk about class, it's the same, you have the same thing. When someone changes, 
um, the, the application, you probably do some UI re refactor and then um, you, the test breaks again. Um, and then usually when you have a lot of selectors, when you have a lot of components, which selector is th that's gonna find you the first one? You don't wanna use the nth child. That's the worst one you can, yeah. That's the worst thing that you can do. Please don't use the nth child, which is, uh, which usually gives you something like this uh, in record playback tools. And uh, how can you debug this? Uh, it means that every, uh, everything that's gonna change, every small change is gonna break this and it's totally uh, not debuggable. Um, I'm person, some people like uh, functional programming, OOP, aspect oriented, I'm DOP, debug oriented programming. Um, you have to write, for me, you have to write the code so you can debug it as fast as possible. That's, uh, that's the uh, fastest way. Um, so there's a lot of people still will try to use text or inner text or links or partial links. We, we give you all, uh, the browser gives us all that and of course Selenium does too. Uh, but they all tend to be agile, and the problem is that the application keeps changing, and they change a lot. So, so who here is familiar with page objects? Oh, that's great. That's why we're not going to talk about page objects. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, um, I put a link here. I, I did the same uh, uh, talk about page objects two years ago. There's, uh, it's on video, so uh, you have everything in it. Uh, but I, what I'm gonna say is that it does help with locators as well because it helps with the separation. Uh, it forces you to separation of concerns. To have first find the gallery and there's another component that's in charge of that specific gallery. And then of course the, the locators are actually, you, you have to split the locators. You have a locator to find the, the gallery and the locator inside the gallery that has the next and the previous. So that's why I really like the page object, uh, how it helps with uh, finding. So usually it gets the, uh, it gets the locator, uh, some either uh, string locators or the element itself. Uh, we're, and then of course in the later on, we're gonna use it to actually uh, uh, find the element inside of it. So there's two options I'm showing, as I shown here. There's one option which is uh, just concat the strings. Uh, and if you're using WebDriver, which is, uh, it makes sense, you are usually gonna find the inner element uh, inside of it and click. Um, so uh, who here uses locators and who here is uses a web element? So let's start, uh, web elements. Who here uh, concats locators? Okay, so a lot, a lot of people don't use locators um, and that's great. Uh, but there's, the only, there's one advantage of using the, the locators uh, is that you do the search from, actually when you look, you're concatting the strings, when you find something, we are searching for something, it actually does the entire search again. Um, that helps just a bit when um, there used to be a cases with um, uh, people who are familiar with Angular. So people wrote a lot of bad code in Angular, which you had a list, and when every time they changed something, they rendered the list again. Uh, it was re-rendering, and sometimes it had, uh, if you have a reference to, to the list, and now there's another list, uh, you get a stale exception. Uh, do people not familiar with stale exception? Which means you have a reference to a DOM element, that, but then it, that DOM element is gone, there's a new DOM element. Um, and that's what you have to do, you have to do a retry. So if you're using locators and always try to find your way back to that element from, uh, uh, from the root, but, uh, so that always find, even though there's a, the, uh, the element was refreshed, you can still find it and uh, uh, and no stale exceptions. So that's the only thing um, that they, it has advantage. I, I personally recommend using web elements as, uh, as often as you can, unless you have that, that problem. So, so it seems that record playback can't work. That's what I always, uh, always told people, try to convince people uh, that it doesn't work. Um, uh, we don't have much time, um, so I'm gonna, so, Record playback is hard. It's a lot of people that tried, and I'm gonna show, we're gonna skip a lot of things. We're gonna show you what we've done. Um, so, so I'm gonna show you, um, we took a, a different approach uh, in, in seeing how, how to do this. Um, so how can I do this full screen? Okay, it seems. 
Um, so what I've written is uh, something that, um, uh, it's a Chrome extension, just uh, as, as every uh, record playback uh, tool does, uh, which of course, uh, uh, I want to wait until it get to the uh, interesting part. Because recording elements, that's finding what's being clicked, in the, in, uh, it's really easy. So you have those elements, um, but I wanted to show you, first of all, there's a huge advantage of more research to record playback. There's, uh, um, it has a lot of advantages. Uh, writing this kind of test, if it was possible, in three seconds, to give you enormous coverage, that would be awesome. Uh, but record playback doesn't work for a lot of reasons. Uh, not just that the elements keep breaking, uh, how do you use reuse? So there's a lot of things. Uh, for example, I always miss this kind of thing. When you can group things together, uh, just give them a name and have a reusable component. Uh, I hated that uh, record playback tools don't, doesn't have reusable components. Um, and uh, the second thing is that in record playback, you can actually do the validations. It's not just about the stimuli. You can do the validation very fast. You just point at something. Um, it's really easy to do almost everything. Uh, this is now I'm showing AppliTools uh, Apple Tools eyes. Uh, it's the same thing. You have to point at something, but then you, you have visual validation instead of text validation. Uh, everything is related to finding an element. So that's why I'm, uh, uh, so that's why I wanted to show here. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, just uh, re a recording that I had and not, I wanted to show you something differently live. Um, so even, even when you're writing code, it would be great if you can, uh, if you can just point at something and, and have it. And when you're writing code, say, okay, I don't care about how you find it. You find it, but I want to use it in, the, in my application. Uh, I just want to give it a name. And, and, uh, and you deal with finding it. Usually you have to deal with page moving from page A to page B, Ajax, uh, those, those, all the properties that keeps breaking. Um, so, so what you really care about is your own business logic. And separating the two would be great. And now I'm gonna show you exactly how we did that. So, so let me, uh, come on, let's move forward. Okay, so looking at the simple click, uh, we look at the properties and talk about how this could be done differently. Come on, let's show this. Yeah, okay, so it has a lot of attributes. So my suggestion was uh, that, first of all, if you're using one path to find an element, then you're doomed. Then uh, you're not doomed right now, but what I mean is that this property can change unless you can uh, you, can, you can know for certain 100% that those properties can change, then uh, I, would, I would say that you have, to, you have to have more than one element. That means that, uh, that how which one of the properties, that single element right here, it has a lot of properties. Is it an ID? I don't know if it's uh, random generated or not. It has a lot of, on key press, values, text. It has tag names. It has an, an index. It has so much properties. But how do I know which one? are actually uh, better to use or not. Uh, so what we're saying is, what I'm, is actually don't choose right now. Actually use all the different properties to find an element and actually find an element using a statistical analysis. What do you mean by that is that uh, s statistically you don't change all the properties at once. What you do is you change one of them or two of them. Every, in every application, Facebook gets, uh, features out every day. Everyone keeps changing their application, but nobody changes it so dramatically um, overnight. And what it means here is that Smia says, try all the different locators. Uh, try all of them. And, and then, when you, every time you run them, you can actually get see scoring of which one is good and which one is bad. How often something changes, that can give you an estimation how good it is. If, it's, uh, if it didn't change for the last six months, it should probably give it a bit of better scoring. So I mean, so I'm saying two things here. One is don't, tr don't use or trust just one, use a few, uh, but then you wanna know who to choose uh, the weights, who do, who do I pick, who's better. Um, and and this, is, this is something that you can do from actually from run to run. That's actually something that nobody uh, actually did was 
look at every time you ran. Did you find it or not? It's very simple. Find it. And then when we uh, find the element and the pa test pass, I can, uh, I can look at the, I can look post-mortem and say, oh, so it passed. Uh, those, old, those five said it's pointing to that one, and the last one said it's pointing to the, the other element. So I trusted them because their weights are stronger. Uh, and then when it, and it worked, so I know I can even make them even stronger. Um, and it's more than that. It's not just a specific property. Um, either, uh, if that would be simple if it's just uh, one property. Usually it depends on other elements. Um, so for example, uh, the, in, the index, the nth child, it depends on first finding the parent element. Uh, if you're looking at an ID, you have a lot of elements that, uh, that it might depend on. Uh, the strength of, uh, of the ID is actually, if you remove one of the elements, one of the parent elements, uh, you can still find it. Uh, so you have to keep um, a close, not just about properties and how you find the specific properties, actually there's a, there's a connection between this element right here and this property and to its parent element. So you have to uh, figure out how the relationship between each property and other elements in the system. Uh, and this is something that you should wanna do uh, almost every time you run it. The more, the more you run, the more it gets smarter and it knows your application. So when you change some property, you still find it and, then, uh, and the computer learns and you get better and better. Um, so I guess it's something that, um, so it's, it's something that uh, really, really helps. Um, uh, well, we don't have to see that, it, that it's working. Um, usually you wanna see that the locators, uh, uh, locators uh, the way that it's changing after you run it. Uh, that's why usually if I go back, um, where's the properties? Um, usually you have, you have a way here you have a way to, um, to improve. I, of course, we have reassigned, but every element you want to improve it and tell it to improve it. You want to say, oh, no, 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 no. This was wrong. This is, not, this is not that element. You were wrong at the first time. This is the element that I wanted. And then you have to, uh, uh, you can manually train it and it says, run it again, and then say, improve. This is it. This is the, something that you can do the first few times. Um, and then we added something that actually, Every time you run, it improves automatically, uh, given that the test uh, failed or passed. Um, um, so, uh, so, so the, the reason I added a lot of those uh, different type of text validation, image validation, uh, uh, custom some custom validation uh, that depends because everything depends on locators. If we solve, um, I think that if we solve the locators problem, we're gonna it's gonna boost. Uh, development time in 50% uh, and the maintenance in about 80%. Uh, we've done, um, I, we're gonna get, get in a few months a case study out that we did in NetUp uh, trying to, did, um, uh, we, they tried with uh, both um, regular Selenium with Angular uh, and uh, with Lacto and we tried this and see how it works and the improvement. Uh, we saw a huge improvement uh, huge improvement in development time and uh, in automation time, uh, maintenance time. Um, so that's very important. Um, so, and of course, uh, oh, that's, uh, and everything, you have Selenium, and once you use Selenium, the nice part is, I always, I always tell people, uh, use Selenium, whatever product you're building, use Selenium, and that's because you get the support of all the browsers and remote Selenium grids as well. Uh, here I'm showing that I'm adding labels to that specific test, and then I'm actually, uh, if I'm gonna run it, uh, you can run it uh, using in the remote browser, because you have a command line interface, you're opening a browser somewhere, and you just run it in the command line. Um, and then the same thing uh, just runs remotely. Um, so I run it there remotely, and then uh, I wanna keep it, um, the nice thing is that you can, of course, whatever that's run in remotely, you can, uh, you can see it and you can see that it's running and you can actually open it and see it, see it running uh, in, the remote, uh, in the remote server. Uh, so 
of course, I, I changed it to be slower. I made the test fail. Um, when everything, when you have Selenium, you, you can get screenshots. So that means you know on the fly what's happening in the remote, uh, remote browser. You know exactly what you got. Um, uh, this is why I love Selenium. More than everything, the fact that it's a standout, it means now everything that everyone's building, if it's Sauce Labs or Marzo Stack, everyone's building with the same standout. Uh, so that's the important thing of having uh, everyone using the same tool. It means that everyone now complying to it, and now uh, it becomes uh, um, it becoming uh, the standard, whether a de facto standard, now W3 standard. Um, so same with mobile. And, um, and before I get to the questions, um, what I did want to show you, and of course you can pass arguments and different arguments and doing if and everything you wanted. Um, something else that we're actually trying to build right now, uh, so I, uh, this is something that is not out yet, and I hope uh, that you'll get, get feedback from you guys. Um, I, well, we're actually, the only, um, the big advantage of this it would be, um, uh, and I think that it's, I'm gonna show, I found a bug. So one plus one usually is three, in where I come from. One plus one is three. Is three. Uh, but uh, I found a bug, and, and it says on, on the Google calculator, it says that it's two. And I wanna, I wanna report that bug. So what we're trying to do is add something so you can, uh, you can have an, uh, you can record the, the scenario and then uh, send it to your developer. You can uh, export it to Jira, QC, or Trello, whatever you guys are using. Uh, I hope you're using not Excel. What are, who's using Excel? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, so you can have exported that uh, that scenario, so people can. Uh, when you have a open a bug. The only k good case would be if you have a reproducible scenario. So that's what I wanted. I wanted to show you, I wanted to, the, someone to show this is the scenario. I want you to give me from now on, the developer, I want uh, uh, actually always give me a reproducible scenario. So you, you start recording with those smart locators, then you say, what's wrong? You say, you specify this is wrong, and the value shouldn't be two as it is right now. Uh, I want you to give me uh, what is the expected, for example, the expected text. Uh, we didn't add uh, Apple tools there or uh, other visual validations. Uh, so we just started with the textual. And now we actually, it creates a text. What you have right now is um, it exports to Jira uh, or whatever. Uh, it exports so you have the textual validation, the textual representation of what was the bug, of, of what happened. Uh, you see it's exactly, you have the extra representation, you have screenshots for every step, you have a video, and you actually have a test which you can click play and uh, reproduce. Um, so we're not perfect yet, so we're adding a lot of things for the expected value uh, that should be uh, added automatically, I would think. Um, and then you just, you just publish it. I configured that one to, to Jira. Some people use here Jira. Okay, okay, so. Um, um, so this created uh, a ticket automatically with all those steps that the reproducible scenarios that you wanted. And, um, and you have those small locators so he can, it will still work on his machine. So that's, that's something that, uh, uh, it's not out yet, so if someone wants to uh, play with this, uh, let me know. Um, all right, I'll show my email. So it's not out. So, so my, that's my email or Twitter, and um, and I think now it's time for questions. So yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Question, yes, yes, and the Ajax. Uh, what I did there was actually, you have a me retry mechanism. You try to find that element. That's what I said with the locator. Uh, so I'll repeat the question. Um, a specific element that probably looks the same, kind of the same, but it keeps refreshing and generating as w again and again. Um, 
So, uh, so using Selenium, I would probably use, though in here I will try to find it, again, before acting on it, I will try to find it uh, using uh, uh, the selecto, not the web element, the locator, uh, and then act on it, and if it, there's an exception, I would try to do a retry. Uh, but this is, that means that you have to write the, this code uh, on every element, so I would probably even wrap the web element, I would uh, create uh, my, your own web element that has, uh, uh, that has the locators and uh, ask from the uh, and then does the retry for you. Uh, that's what I did. When I when I showed you, that would probably work because we try again, again until until it finds that element. Um, okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Questions? More? Yeah. Wait a second. Sorry. In, in that case, how do you distinguish between an actual ag application bug and as well as your script bug, actually? If, sorry, if I have... Uh, just just to go continue with his ans uh, question. Ah, you're talking about the bug report, though? No, no, no. I said, uh, you said that we have to retry again and again, uh, yeah. right? So uh, how do we distinguish that it's an application bug or we just it, uh, it's a selenium hurdle? You do... You, um, so you mean that if there is a bug, uh, how do we distinguish between a couldn't find it? So it depends on, you have to give it usually a timeout. Even Selenium has implicit uh, wait. Wait, yeah, uh, that's true. Wait. So you have to, if it didn't load for 30 seconds, that means it's a bug. But but so you said we, if the element is not available, you just have to retry. You have to retry, yeah. So uh, let us say for the first retry, it was not there. And again, we try to do something else and we retry it by highlighting it again. But and if but there, after 30 seconds, it, okay. it doesn't work, then you, uh, then you say, okay. So it doesn't, it's not there for 30 seconds. That's a lot. Okay. Uh, eventually it has to, you have to find it. Yes. Uh, wait a second. So no, I want the audience to, uh, this is being recorded, so. Uh, this is my scenario. So in one of my uh, applications, uh, I don't find any locator. So the problem here is uh, left side, I'll be having some text and corresponding value will be uh, given in the right side in the same page. So currently how I am handling it, uh, using uh, contains text followed by following sibling, that way I'm finding the next element, whatever it is. Yeah, so you're talking about the parent and the siblings actually. Yep. So, uh, um, so yeah, of course, this is, uh, this is something that, uh, as I said, it's not trivial using uh, CSS locators or, uh, yeah. yeah, you're doing it this in two stages. You find the element, the parent, and then uh, using contains, uh, I'm uh, going with the following sibling. If it is child, I'll mm -hmm. be traversing to that. And if I wanted to go to parent, so I'm going to parent. If it is ancestor, so that I'm somehow identifying it. But the question here is, I don't know whether to rely on this uh, technique uh, for me to uh, continue with the future. So is there any alternative way to identify the text without any locators also? No, so in your case, there's not. Um uh, there's no other way. Either you ask people, uh, you ask developers to add more uh, the, the text maybe uh, as some kind of metadata on, and some attributes on your selecto, on the element that you have to click on. That's the only option. The second option is uh, wait for those kind of tools that actually does that for you and know that you have to find an element that has the text and then use the parent. And So I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. you have to wait for those kind of tools. Okay, thank you. I have a solution for that. So you oh, can write no, a okay. no, you can use a single XPath and you can put a condition in the XPath to find the sibling or the parent or other siblings based on the other siblings. Yeah, that's yeah, that's so that. yeah, apart from that, suppose if you check, there will be a, some uh, either attributes will be depend on that. Say example, the class here may be depend on some other attributes like a data tracking, data tra if you just open your uh, uh, flip card. So in the flip card, the top menus will be having the sub menu. The sub menus will be in a separate tag, and the top menus will be in a separate one. There will be a relationship between these two by using either attributes of those two. So you have to relate that. Uh, so I'm going to leave you in a in a private room. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we have time for one last question. So, uh, but of course, afterwards you I'm here and tomorrow, so everyone can ask me so many questions. Yes. Hi. So, uh, how long does it take for your statistical locators to be, yeah, really good, basically? Um, it, oh, first of all, this, the, as I said, it's this, the first one is actually works really well. Works 90% of the time on the first try. 
because we're trying all the different, uh, different parameters. Uh, so if you have a lot of attributes, if you have more than, uh, more than two, then it's gonna work, uh, most likely it's gonna work on the first try. Uh, the, problem, the only problem is when you don't have any of them and you only have things like nth child, uh, that's the problem. I've been considering doing uh, like a visual, uh, um, like a visual uh, alert that actually if you have only nth child, if the selectors, if the scoring is very low and it will probably fail in the future, then, uh, then I'm uh, like a visual, something that's gonna say beware, you have to change that property. You have to add more, more uh, properties to that. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna be outside, answer more questions. Thank you.